so much for coming. Um, this is the Maths and Sciences Q&A as part of the virtual open day. So if you're here, hopefully that means you're considering studying at Trinity, uh, which obviously we, we want you all here because we think it's we think it's the best college. Um, but no, thank you all so much for coming. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the more sort of like subject specific questions. But if you do have a burning general question, feel free to pop that in the Q&A as well. Um, so I'm Lizzie. I am the school's liaison officer at Trinity, which means I work a lot with schools and prospective students and try and really go for the hard sell about how amazing Trinity is. Um, and today we are joined by Professor Imre Leader. Um, so he is a fellow and he also teaches maths at the college. Um, and he is also the admissions tutor for art, for not for arts, for sciences um, and maths. So um, yeah, I will hand over to you Imre um, and we can get started with some questions. Right, well, <clears throat> welcome everyone. It's, it's nice not to see you, but to know you're here. <clears throat> I'm going to talk for a few minutes about various things. I'll talk about life, colleges, and admissions, just a few words. Well, by life, I mean life in Cambridge, not in general. I'll try and keep that short, <clears throat> and then we'll get on to your questions. So basically, Cambridge is unusual. It's got this dual setup of colleges and the departments. So departments are things like Department of Physics, Department of Chemistry, Department of Maths. That's where you have your lectures. And then colleges, there are more than 20 colleges. <clears throat> your college is where you live, eat, sleep, have your friends and so on. And there's no such thing as the College for Chemistry, the College of Physics. Pretty much every college does all subjects. So a typical day would be you might go out to the university for your lectures, maybe in the morning of two hours of lectures, that'll be say in Department of Chemistry or Department of Genetics. The rest of your life is spent in your college. <clears throat> With one exception, if you have practicals to do, those are also <clears throat> done in your department normally. So <clears throat> your college is where you spend your time basically, where you make friends and so on. And typical working week would be you go to your lectures, you copy down the notes, maybe you understand it in real time, more likely you don't, you have to go back to your room and think about them to make sense of them, and the lecturer will give out some sheets of exercises, problems, problem sheets, and that's what you do for your supervisions. Supervisions are these very intensive things which are two students to one grown-up for about an hour a week in each subject, and that's where the real learning happens. So you've attempted the problems on the problem sheet and you go along to supervision and your supervisor will say things like, your question six was wonderful, or your question five was correct, here's the best way of thinking about it. Or you made a little mistake in question four, or your question three is wrong, or some polite way of saying that. <clears throat> or you might say, I can't see how to do the second half of question two. Or you might say, Question one, help, I can't get started. Or you might say, I'm lost in this course, please explain the last three lectures to me. So they're very intensive. That's where the real learning happens. It's, it's in your work for supervisions and in what happens in the supervision. As long as you're a little bit organized, there's plenty of time for everything. A typical load is, for a typical student, is about two hours per day of lectures, two hours per week of supervisions, and maybe one practical per week. So it's very different to school, you have huge amounts of free time. So as long as you're, say, even slightly organized, there's loads of time to drink coffee with your friends, join a club for a game or a sport or a musical instrument, there's, there are huge amounts of spare time. <clears throat> That's basically how life works. Now colleges, colleges vary enormously in size. And the biggest is Trinity, we take about over, over 200 students per year. The smallest are places like Peterhouse and Corpus, which take about 70 per year. So there's an incredible difference between them. <clears throat> as far as we can tell, all colleges have excellent teaching in all subjects. Also, all colleges work really hard to give students arriving as first years a nice start. So very often colleges ask students after a couple of weeks, are you happy with your choice of college? And basically every single person says, I'm sure I'm at the friendliest college in Cambridge. The difference in sizes manifests itself in various ways. I'll start to describe it, and it'll sound like an advert for a small college. 
And I'll say why actually the reason to be at a big college as well. So in a small college, say 70 per year, after a few weeks, you'll know everyone in your year. So supposing you're a natural scientist, you will have friends who are historians doing English, French, maths, and so on, automatically in every new year. In a big college like Trinity, with 200 students, you won't meet all your year. So your initial circle of friends, well, it depends. If you're super shy and or super nerdy, then your friends will be the people doing your subject. If you're if you even are remotely sociable, there are huge numbers of events where you meet other people or dinner in hall. So you will end up meeting many people in other subjects, but you won't know your entire year in the way you do in a tiny college. All right, so far that sounds like an advert for a small college, <coughs> and it sort of is. But here's the difference. In a big college, suppose you get to your third year. Now, whatever subject you're doing, you have a lot of modules to choose between your third year. In a small college, maybe you're the only person doing your subject. And then there'll be no one to talk to. If you're stuck at 2 a.m. on a problem sheet, no one to talk to. Or maybe there's one other person doing it, but you're not friends with them. Whereas in a big college at like Trinity, it is just guaranteed and really guaranteed that whatever option you're doing in your second year or third year, if it's 2 a.m. and you're stuck, you will find a friend doing that course who's awake and will chat to you. So that's a really nice thing. You get some real group spirit going, especially as the years go on and things become more specialized. <clears throat> but basically they're all nice places. If you get a chance, it's really great to come and look at the different colleges or to take a virtual, well, most of our virtual tours online. You may just find one of them just grabs you. This feels right, or I like this architecture, or I like these old buildings, or I like these modern buildings. Almost any, any reason is fine. Um, one thing that you should not do is try and choose a college based on numbers of applicants. And I'll, to explain that, I'll explain a bit about how the admissions process works. This is now my third and final topic. So how does admissions work? <clears throat> you apply to a college, say Trinity. You fill your application forms, and then the college decides whether or not to interview you. In some subject, there's also a, an early assessment, a, a, a test that goes under various names, it may be called thinking skills, but in some there isn't. So your application will be looked at and they'll decide whether or not to interview you. Um, if you're from the UK, there's a very good chance you'll be interviewed, unless you've done very badly in those, in those tests. So to generally speaking, if you're from the UK, there's a very high chance you'll be interviewed. Um, the interview is really about thinking. So you won't really be drilled on your knowledge. It's sort of assumed that A-levels, whatever exams you're doing will test that. They're much more about can you think, meaning can you apply what you know in weird situations? So they're trying to push you to the edge of your comfort zone and beyond. So there's no way to prepare for an interview apart from having a good night's sleep and being ready to be stumped. Nearly everyone after the interview thinks that was awful. Even people who get in, they all think it was awful because they're being pushed to their limits and beyond to, to see how you cope. <clears throat> after, some subjects will give you a written test, by the way, just before the interview. Some will ask you questions at interview. It varies from subject to subject. After the interview, because you decide, would you cope in Cambridge for that subject? And it's important to say that if, you may be very good at your subject, but you're still rejected by the college. That doesn't mean you aren't good at your subject. It means you, they think you wouldn't survive in the very fast, intensive life that is Cambridge. Okay, and then your offer typically will be an offer involving A-level grades, IB, uh, whichever country you're from, we will make you a suitable offer based on your, your country's exams and so on. In some sort of like maths, there are extra exams like STEP we ask them to take. And then at the end of the year, you get your A-levels or results and then you're in. Okay, so there we are. Um, I, I haven't talked yet about the pool, which I'll get to in a second, but I'll just say why you shouldn't play the numbers game. So let's suppose you're applying in I don't know, computer science and it's a college that expects to make 10 offers. Maybe they're gonna make 10 offers and expect eight of you to make the offers, so to take it. So they expect to make 10 offers. Supposing that this year they found they had 12 great applicants. They're not going to say, ooh, 
12 is more than 10, we love all these 12, who are the worst two, we'll kick them out. <coughs> They'll say, okay, we have 12 good ones, we'll, we'll offer all 12 and make two left off, less offers in history or French or something. Equally, <coughs> if they want to make 10 offers and maybe there are only seven people they think would cope in Cambridge, they're not going to say, okay, there's seven we think are good, let's go down to numbers eight, nine, 10 anyway. They're gonna say, okay, we'll have seven offers this year and offer more, more in economics. So basically that's why you shouldn't collect numbers. Obviously, if a college wants to make 10 offers and had a thousand applicants who are amazing, they would have to get rid of some of those, but that basically doesn't happen. Okay, so that, that's basically why it isn't good to play the numbers game. Um, the other reason it isn't good to play the numbers game is that if you look at a list of stats and see, aha, last year in college X, there weren't many applicants in computer science, so I'll apply them, for, increase my chances. You'll find this year it's totally changed. Everyone's applied there for the exactly same reason. So the fluctuations year to year are much bigger than budget between the colleges. Okay, let me now talk about the pool. The pool is somehow a great leveler. And the way the pool works is as follows. Uh, when I said the college makes their decisions, if they think you're good enough, they'll make you an offer. If not, they won't. What actually happens is if they think you're borderline, but slightly below the offer, you aren't rejected, you're put into the pool. And colleges that want a few more people, like it, in my example, the college that wanted 10 computer scientists that only had seven they liked, can come fishing in the pool. That means they look at your file, they read about your application, they read your interview report, and they might say, we'll take that person from the pool. And that is the real leveler. That's what really guarantees that whichever college you apply to, the chance of getting into Cambridge is about the same. Because if you're borderline, you're put in the pool. And the pool is used a lot, by the way. It's, it's not just occasional people who are taken out of the pool. Certainly in science subjects, it's very, very common to take out the, be taken out of the pool. And that's really why it doesn't matter which college you apply to in terms of your chance of getting in. And that's basically why we, we say, pick a college you like and apply to that college. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Um, now, some people have submitted questions in advance, so I'll, ask, I'll deal with those. I'll just say that in general, any questions that you think of after today, just contact our admissions office. It's best to email them, not to phone them. Email them, they'll get back to you. And also, when there are subject specific questions, I'll try to answer them, but very often I'll say, I don't know, email the admissions office, and then they can talk to the subject specialists and give you a definitive answer rather than my rubbish answer. Okay, so let me deal with some of the questions that were asked um, initially. So one question is, what are the computer science interviews like and what preparations can be made? So in pretty much all science subjects, as I said, your interview involves thinking questions. So the only preparation you can make is to be awake, to be willing to think, and also not to be shocked if you're, if you're asked a question you can't answer. It's also very common that they'll ask you a question, you can't answer it, and then they'll give you a hint. They'll say, well, you know, consider the angular momentum or consider the reaction time or something like that. Because they want to see how you cope with hints. So it's also very important that if you're given a hint and you don't understand the hint, you mustn't just nod and say, yes, yes, sir. You must say, I don't understand the hint. Because if you just nod and say yes, they'll think this person, even with a hint, couldn't do the question. That'd be bad. So you need to be honest with them. The questioner goes on to ask, how heavily weighted is a result of the TMUA for the application? That is an, uh, an initial test you make after your application, but before interviews. Um, it's kind of thinking skills, but in maths. And the answer is, for most of these initial tests, which come before your selective interview, it's not heavily weighted. You don't have to do very well in it. You just have to not do very badly in it. So they will deselect people who do so badly in that, that it's clear they wouldn't be viable as an applicant at Cambridge. But there's certainly no sense which you have to ace that to get through. As I said, most people get interviewed, especially from the UK. And in some sense, interviews is the real hurdle. Okay, uh, then there's a question about 
how the selection of colleges affects your chances of getting in. Well, as I've said, that um, that's pretty much equal over all colleges. And the question goes on to ask about entrance exams in different subjects. Again, this varies from subject. So if you look at the subject website on the Trinity main site, it'll tell you about whether or not they have a, a pre-admissions test or not. There's a question about engineering. Is the whole further maths course essential to learn for engineering? Um, the answer for things like engineering or computer science or natural science is that, of course, these are mathematical subjects. So the more maths you've done, the better. So doing maths and further maths is better than doing maths, not because at admissions you'll be crossed off for not doing further maths, that'll be fine, but just because you've done less, you spent less hours thinking about maths. So somehow your, your maths brain isn't as mature or well-developed. So that's really why they say additional maths preferred, further maths preferred. It's not because of particular topics so much as your general hours around maths. Um, but the question goes on to ask, is an A star in maths better than two A's in maths and further maths? Um, we, we, we'd like you to have A stars, please. So the normal offer would be something like, in a science subject, A star, A star, A, in your three A levels. And it, it might be A star, A star, A in your three levels, A levels, with the A stars being in those two subjects. That might happen. Um, there's a question. For engineering, is it beneficial to demonstrate knowledge through a subject like English or subject like numerical or maths or science? The answer is we definitely prefer scientific subjects because they're better for your science brain, basically. You're, of course, welcome to do an A-level in an art subject as well. But in terms of what prepares you best for the engineering course, it'll be science subjects. Uh, there's a question about mature students. Is there a separate admissions process? The answer is no, it's the same process for everyone. Um, some colleges are very keen on mature students. So at the pool, if you're a mature student, there's a slightly different process in that obviously the colleges who specialize in mature students um, have first selection on you. Someone asks, is it required to complete your A-levels to apply for an undergraduate degree course, as opposed to being in year 12? Um, the answer is, you need to be doing A-levels. So you normally people would apply during year 13. In other words, with their, so they'd apply say in a month's time, planning to take A-levels this coming June. Um, you can't apply if you're in year 12 and not doing A-levels. Now that's all of the questions on the, that were pre-asked. Let me try and go to, now, Lizzie, it says here, open three, answered nine. Does that mean you've answered nine of them? Um, so Stacey's been answering a few of oh, them. Um, okay, but, um, I'll, I'll give you a break from talking and I'll do one of them. Um, so someone asked, is the environment more competitive at Trinity than at other colleges for math students? How does this affect the students? Um, so I went to Cambridge, but I didn't go to Trinity. And I am ashamed to say that I fell into the trap of being like, oh, Trinity must be so boring. Everyone just works all the time. And then I actually visited as a student and I was really, really surprised at how just friendly and open it was. Um, so we have a lovely college bar, um, which you don't have to drink. It's more of a coffee shop during the day. Um, and it honestly is one of those places where you could sit down next to someone and just start a conversation. Um, people aren't like, you know, snobby and people don't just think about their work. Um, and at uni, it doesn't tend to be as competitive. It tends to be more collaborative. So, uh, you know, it's really likely that you'll go for lunch and you'll see a group of um, like math students sat together doing their work and like helping each other out. It's not like, oh, I'm not gonna share any answers with you because everyone wants everyone to succeed and everyone wants everyone to get the best grades possible. So. Don't believe the rumours, Trinity, it's a very nice place um, and everyone there wants to help you succeed. It's not like you're just thrown into this like doggy dog world and you have to sort of fight for yourself. Okay, there's a question, can we visit Trinity as an overseas student? The answer is if you can, if you can get to England or Britain without quarantining for a thousand days or whatever it is, then you're welcome to visit, absolutely. And in general, if you're ever in Cambridge and you're looking around colleges, if the college has a big sign on the day you visit saying close, strictly no visitors, if you say the magic words, I'm a potential admissions applicant, they'll almost certainly let you in. There's a question about what are the types of questions you might be asked in medicine? Could they be about case studies? The answer is they could be about anything. They'll, be, they'll typically be thinking things. They won't be asking you particular facts from your say, 
biology or chemistry A level, they'll be asking you something you haven't thought about. It might be an ethical thing in medicine. It might be a practical thing. They might ask you a question, see how you reply, and get the conversation going from there. Um, question about balls and formal dinners. Uh, yes, so there are lots of balls and lots of formal dinners, and you can choose. It's up to you. Um, there's a very informal, normal lunch and dinner in hall. There are twice or three times a week uh, formal dinners where the food is nicer, but they're totally optional. No, not, you don't have to go to them. And then there's a once a year May ball. Lizzie, do you want to add to that at all? Um, yeah, I think like formal dinners mainly you go if it's someone's birthday or you want to celebrate something. It's definitely not, you don't have to wear your Harry Potter robe to just go and get some hash browns in hall. Um, and it's really, really nice. Um, and the May ball is very fancy, ridiculously fancy. Um, and everyone dresses up, but um, it's just a chance to sort of like celebrate the end of the year with all of your friends. Um, and lots of different colleges do them. And it's quite like a, it's quite <coughs> like a secret market trying to get tickets to Trinity's and tickets to other colleges. Um, so it's, it's really nice, yeah. There's a lot of cool Cambridge things that seem a bit intimidating, but then you get here and you realise they're just like good fun. There's a question, will deferring your entry for a year reduce your chances of accepting? The answer is absolutely not. When we interview you and make a decision, it's purely based on would you cope with the course? So it's never based on things about um, whether you're deferring for a year or not, never ever. Um, in, in terms of, is it a good idea to defer? That's a different question. And normally our view is that there are positives and negatives. Um, the positives are you broaden your mind, get more experience of life, you grow up, which is great. The negatives are you get rusty in your chosen subject. So roughly speaking, the view at Trinity is, if you, if you ever asked our advice, is that if you're taking a gap year for something exciting, like traveling the world or being an au pair in Austria or whatever you're doing, working traveling that's great if you're just taking a gap year to go and work in office for a year that isn't so great there's a question if you're applying for maths will the interview be solely based on maths or have lots of personal questions the answer is it'll be solely based on maths and that's true in all subjects you won't get asked any personal questions at all it's purely purely subject based which is a shock for some students so it's quite important to notice that that when you come to an interview, they're not going to spend five minutes talking about the weather and, you know, what pets do you have? It'll be, or what books do you read even? It'll be straight on with your, with your subject. If you're prepared, that they want to learn about you, how you think about that subject, the interviewers, their time is limited. So they want to kind of, they want to crack on straight away. Um, <clears throat> there's a question, if you're planning on doing medicine, would it be busier than the courses about the same? Now by busier, um, I don't know if you mean, are there more hours in the week to spend on stuff? Which the answer is, there are quite a lot of hours in the week, yes. So medical, med medical students <coughs> do have to work quite hard. I also just have to work hard. Medicine students famously have to work pretty hard. But if you mean busier in terms of the application success rate, no, you can look at the stats for that and they're, they're kind of fairly constant and fairly uniform across the colleges. Um, there's a question about <clears throat> are GCSEs considered applications as well? The answer is we look at your whole application. So we look at your GCSEs, <clears throat> your A-level predicted grades. We look especially at your teacher report. We we really look at the whole. <clears throat> we really look at the whole at the whole file. Um, GCSEs don't make much of a difference. And in fact, what we find for science applicants is there are normally two types of applicants. Suppose you're applying for say, I don't know, physical natural sciences. There are people who've got at GCSE nines in everything. The people who've got nines in physics, chemistry and maths <coughs> and did terribly everything else. Those are the two patterns. We're very, those are absolutely fine. <coughs> I think the one place it does make a difference potentially, if you're in the pool and you've got a big string of fantastic GCSEs, it just might make a difference in a borderline case because somebody might say, this person, their string of nines shows they're able to work hard at things they don't like. So they have good work habits. And that just might, I've seen that make a difference in the pool a few times. 
So I don't think it'll make a difference to your main application much, but it might make a difference in the pool. <clears throat> How many internationals get of medicine to Cambridge in Trinity? That I don't know. You could email the admissions office to ask that one. Uh, the best way to prepare for a maths interview, someone asked, should you be reviewing A level and step or focus on Olympiad questions? Um, that's again, it's really entirely up to you. As far as we're concerned, the more hours you've spent doing maths, the better for you, because the more mature your maths brain will be. Um, so if you want to review some step questions, do Olympiad questions, read a popular maths book, look at your A level notes again and again and again, those are all fine by us. As far as we're concerned, the more hours you spend, the better. Um, there's a question, are natural science effects on the internet from Cambridge? Um, the answer is supposed to be no. So it should be that at the moment, if you aren't already a Cambridge student, you can't stay lectures in Cambridge. However, often these things leak and there are you know, weird dodgy sites and so on. So I'll say there are none available officially on the internet, but th there might be. And if that's leading on to a general question about lectures online or not, the answer is, as far as we know, this coming year, everything will be in person. It'll probably also be recorded in case, you know, you test positive, have to isolate for a few days. But generally, everything's supposed to be in person, as far as we know. There's a question, if I'm deferring for engineering, would it be better to work as a gap year at a prep school? Or would industry experience be better? Um, the answer is, Teaching at a prep school might be quite nice, actually. That might be quite broadening, so that might be a good thing to do. Industry experience would be great, so those both sound um, those both sound quite good things. The exception would be if you're teaching at a prep school, but you've been asked to teach geography and history and not science, that, that probably wouldn't be so great. Someone asks, if you get nines in everything but eight history and English, will it make a difference? And the answer is, as I've said, no, that's completely fine. Um, we really care much more about science CSEs. Uh, what skills are good to include in personal statements? <coughs> um, so basically, I'll, I'll say something and I'll qualify it. Your personal statement is completely irrelevant and counts for zero. Now, I'll qualify that. In medicine, your personal statement is very important because that's where you show what volunteering you've done what medicine you've done so far. And medicine, that's extremely important. So in medicine, it's vital in the personal statement to list everything you've done, the volunteering on hospital wards and so on and so on. In other science subjects, uh, the personal statement counts for roughly zero. We don't want it to count for zero. I'll tell you why it counts for zero. There are two reasons, and then I'll qualify that slightly. So we would love to see individual, exciting, personal statement taught us about you. But unfortunately, <coughs> schools always force you into a uniform pattern. So if you try and write an individual personal statement, your school will say, no, no, they don't want that. So for example, every personal statement we ever see begins in paragraph one with a statement, I like this subject because, and then something, you know, at age eight, an anecdote happened, or because physics is important in the world, or maths is logical. Now we know those aren't true. We know that when people love a subject, they know they love it. They don't know why they love it, they love it. But your school will say, no, no, you've got to give a reason. So that's always this weird paragraph one. Then paragraph two, everyone lists what are the, you know, two of the current six popular books to mention that year. Chaos theory, quantum something and so on. And so on and so on. And the worst is paragraph five, where your school will say, you must put your extracurricular interests and what you've learned from them. So for example, we'd love someone to say, you know, I love playing football because I like the aggression and the scoring of goals. But no, no, your school will say, Cambridge wants to know what you, what you got out of your sport. So in fact, all these personal statements, without exception says, I play the following sport, comma, which has taught me teamwork and leadership. And they should all say that. So that's one reason why we don't take any account of personal statements. We do read them, but they're all the same. The second is, <clears throat> We don't need to be convinced that you're passionate about your subject. As far as we're concerned, if you're, if you're applying to us, you love your subject. We care about, are you good at your subject? Can you do the sums? And that you can't convince us in a personal statement. That's what the interview's for. 
Um, it's different in arts subjects. In arts subjects, it's very important that saying which books you've read will influence the discussion in the interview, but not in science subjects. Okay, so having said it counts for zero apart from medicine, let me now take that back slightly. Any factual things you've done, objective things, are great to put down. So, you know, if you play an instrument to grade eight, put that down. If you've got a bronze or silver or gold in some maths challenge or physics olympiad, put that down. Because those are some objective things. They won't make much of a difference, but they might in the pool. So, for example, if you have grade eight violin, someone in the pool might say, aha, this shows that this person shows real commitment to something. They are able to work hard at something. So in a borderline case, it, it might make a difference. So there we are. But, but in some sense, people often worry about personal instead of thinking, how can I stand out from the crowd in my personal statement? And I want to go back to what I said earlier on, you, you're not doing that. From UK schools, most people are interviewed. You don't need to stand out from the crowd. Best way to prepare for an engineering interview is a question, <clears throat> and that is um, just to be awake and to have thought a lot about your A-levels, as before. There's an interesting question, would being younger, like age 16, put you at disadvantage if you all the qualifications? The general rules are, if you're under 18, we're a bit cautious, um, and if you're under about 17 and a half, it's, it's unlikely that you, you'd show the right emotional resilience to be to be admitted. Um, there's no there are no strict age rules. For legal reasons, there can't be. But generally speaking, it's it's extremely rare for us to make an offer to someone who'd be under say 17 and a half at, at, at admission. And we do find that people who apply young when they have got in, they do miss out a lot on the social life. So if they're age 16 and they're around with 18 year olds, they just have a very it's very hard for them to make friends and to to get into the culture of being in a college and all colleges have the same thing they've all found that when they've admitted people who are young it's generally not been nice and the person's often got some depression as a result <clears throat> there's an interesting question would life at uni be more relaxed than something like secondary school and sixth form we have strict schedule every week yes absolutely you have so much free time lectures might be at 10 o'clock 11 o'clock in the morning maybe at 9 and 10 and apart from your two hours a day of lectures and maybe a once a week afternoon practical all you have are, say, two supervisions. So, as I said earlier on, you have so much time that's your own, it's just, it's just ridiculous. So it's, it's much, much more relaxed. I say there's huge amounts of time to drink coffee with friends, play board games, do whatever you want to do, as long as you're even slightly organized. As a rough rule of thumb, we tend to say, of your two weekly supervisions, if you start working for supervision two days in advance, that's great. If you start one day in advance, that's not great. The reason is that the questions you get asked tend to be kind of thinking questions, not rote questions. So it, it isn't usually the case of read the question, flick back through your notes, find the page that answers it, write down the answer. That, that, that doesn't really happen. Um, they're much more thinking questions. Like as an example, suppose you, you think back to when you first met, say, the quadratic equation in maths, the formula for solving the quadratic equation. When you first meet that formula, what do you do first? About 50 examples of it. If that came here in a Cambridge maths course and you met the formula, question one on the problem sheet might be, why is that formula correct? Question two might be, can you devise a similar formula for the following non quadratic equation? So they're, they're much more um, thinking kind of, and that's really why we say starting work for supervision one day before isn't good, but two days before is fine. Question which must be for Lizzie, what's the food like in Trinity? I'd say very good. I'm a vegetarian and there's always a good vegetarian and um, vegan option. Um, sorry, my cat is just jumping everywhere. Hold on. Um, no, there's always a really good vegetarian vegan option and they always do a really good potato option. So like chips, hash browns, etc. Very good. Good desserts, good salad bar. I I enjoy it a lot. Um, but yeah, there's something for everybody. And I think the nice thing about Trinity is you don't have to eat in hall every day. Um, so you can self cater if you want, um, but you can um, just go to hall and, you know, see your friends a couple of times a week. Um, so it's a very like pay as you go system, which I think works for a lot of students. Okay, there's a question. If you're pooled and given a place in a college that's more than 40 minutes away from your department, 
can you ask for a different college? I think that applies to Goethe, which is a long way out. Now, there are two answers to this. One is that nothing in Cambridge is very far away. Even Girton is only a couple of miles out. You know, compared to London, that's just trivial. Um, more to the point, everyone who is pulled to different college ends up as a loving their college. By two weeks in, they all say, I love my college. I wouldn't change it. You to talk to anyone, for example, at the college Girton, which is more than 40 minutes away, they will never for a moment say, well, it's a bit far away. They'll say, it's super friendly. I love it. I've got such great friends. So trust me, if you're pulled to a college far away, you should be very happy. Far away only means a couple of miles away. There's a question, do factual things like winning a scholarship matter in the personal state? The answer is, as I said, it's worth putting them down. They probably won't make it make a difference, but they might in a borderline case. So factual things do put down. There's a question, what are all the tests I have to give for getting admission in Trinity for maths? So for maths, <clears throat> um, what happens is there's no deselection test happening in advance of the interview. And this year, there's no written test. It'll just be that at the interview, you get asked questions. Most years, when, in non, when things are in person, non-COVID times, um, we give you an hour long test before the interview. But this year, it's just in the interview. So you'll be asked questions in the interview, no actual written test. And then if you get an offer in maths, it'll normally be an A-level condition and a STEP condition. STEP is this exam you take at the same time as A-levels, which tests your math skills way more than A-level does. Um, I certainly wouldn't worry about STEP or even think about STEP or look at a STEP AP yet. Once you have your offer in January, there's then plenty of time to find out about STEP, to find out about it, to register for it. And of course, almost no school in Britain will help you with STEP. They won't have a STEP class, but there are many online resources, many groups. You can always email our admissions office. There's a question, do students of minority ethnic heritage have any advantage or disadvantages? The answer is neither. We treat everyone on ability. It's very much a, a meritocracy. So, um, so when you, in the admissions process, everyone is treated on how good are they? That There are no quotas in either a positive or negative direction. There's a question, how important is the reference data? That's very important. We read that very carefully from the school. The school that's very important. Um, it's interesting. It used to be the case that school's letters would be brutally honest, would say, this person is lazy, or this person isn't good. Um, as of about 10 years ago, students and their parents can read or can demand the school show the letter they've sent in. So now letters from schools never say anything negative, but we've learned how to read those letters and we know what they mention and don't mention. So the answer is, it's very important. So you, you need to be you need to be nice to your teachers, basically. But again, it's very unlikely we wouldn't interview you. Say in maths, for example, if you're from the UK, really the only way we wouldn't interview would be if you had poor predicted grades and a poor reference letter. So if the reference letter, if you had poor predicted grades, the reference letter said, this person's lazy, but they really are talented. If they worked hard, it'd be great. We are certain to interview them. Actually, if the if the reference letter said this person's a troublemaker, I think we're also sure to interview because it sounds like you're an interesting person. I'm not, I'm not saying you should be a troublemaker, but basically we, we want anything that's interesting or positive, we, 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 we tend to like. Um, there's a question, if you're applying to the maths program, is it advisable to have your maths teacher write a recommendation? That's a question we get asked quite a lot, actually. And the answer is, most schools have their own system and you can't choose. So in most schools, it'll be either the, the head teacher or the person in charge of US applications, UCAS, who writes the reference, but they will always consult your teachers. Nearly always the, our references we get will say this, 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 and then they'll say, um, their chemistry teacher says, open quote, and then some stuff from the chemistry teacher. So nearly always, you can't choose who writes the reference, but they will consult your other teachers. Um, question, what's the Trinity College Library like? Is it used by staff and students? Absolutely, it's, it's a great library. It's, it's packed with books, many copies of books that are important. Um, it's a great place to study in peace and quiet. A lot of students find that in their room, they sometimes may find it hard to concentrate because of distractions like having their, whatever, 
computer there, books there, records there, whatever it is. Not records, people don't have records these days, but whatever they have. Um, so people often like to go and study them in the library. Lizzie, is that a correct answer? Yeah, the library is really nice. Um, it's very safe as well. You can only get in if you're a Trinity member and there are lots of people there in their pyjamas or their comfy clothes. Um, but it is really nice, especially in the exam term, you often find lots of gaggles of people outside the library having a bit of a solidarity rant about revision and then they all go back inside. So it is a really nice place to get out of your room and see other people, but also do your work. Aren't there often donuts provided outside the library in the cloisters in exam term? Yeah, and I will say that I, as a member of staff, have taken some of the donuts before. But yeah, there are refreshments, so another perk. Um, there's a question, during an interview, do the interviewers look solely or ability to solve the problem, or your process and your personality as to how you approach the problem? So we don't have your personality, and if we did, we wouldn't take many science people. Um, but we do, in, we do care about how you're thinking about the problem. So certainly after the interview, the interviewers do not say to themselves, they solved two problems and didn't do the third one. They will be thinking about what your thought process were like. That's this, again, this idea that they'll give you a problem which probably stumps you, and then they offer you hints, and they see how you react to the hints. So in some sense, it's great if you can to cry, kind of talk aloud. If you're thinking deeply about some question they've asked you, you know, how do um, drones work or something, it's often great to say a few things, tell them your thoughts, so they know you're thinking. There's a question, what's the accommodation at Trinity compared to other colleges? So you're given accommodation for all the three or four years of your, of your degree and rooms everywhere in college are pretty nice, I would say, actually. I mean, Lizzie, am I allowed to say they're nicer than other colleges on average or are we not allowed to say that? Yeah, I can say that. I've been yeah. in lots of different college rooms and Trinity are some of the nicest. Um, they're also very reasonably priced. And if you want, if having an ensuite is really important to you, as I know it is to a lot of people, you can have one for all, um, all three or four years. Um, but some people like to choose the great courtrooms that are really, really pretty um, and have great views. So yeah, you can live basically anywhere in college, which is really nice. Um, there's a question, would having a result from a test such as the TMUA before the interview make a difference, the answer is <clears throat> all we care about are the tests we set you basically. So you you'll only be deselected if you've done an initial test and done badly on it. There's a question, are there limits to what percent of private school applicants came to accept? And the answer is um, in each admissions round, once the round's underway, it's done purely on ability. So of course there are all kinds, there's always a lot of outreach going on and things for widening participation and so on but once you're in the admissions once you've applied all we care about is how can you do your subject can you do the sums so there's nothing about any kind of quota in a positive or negative direction and that's true at any college all we care about is are you good at your subject um there's a question would already having a star in maths a level taken early be an advantage it doesn't really matter to be honest i Basically, everyone who applies is predicted an A star anyway, pretty much in science. Um, so it, it doesn't really matter if you want to take an exam early or not. Is there a pre interview assessment for physical natural sciences? I'm not sure about that. Uh, that's you best email the admissions office to ask them. Um, advice for a student planning to apply <clears throat> just pick a college and go for it. You know, there's nothing, uh, I wouldn't waste hours picking a college there's one thing i will mention actually <clears throat> there's a thing called an open application you can do and that says you apply to cambridge you don't name a college and then you're assigned one kind of a, in some random process based on number of applicants and so on that sounds great but it actually doesn't work out so well because suppose you do an open application and you're assigned to college x when college x consider you they'll somehow be aware you didn't choose them and that you don't love them now, that shouldn't have been anything, of course, but I think psychologically it makes a tiny difference. An open application is almost saying, I couldn't even be bothered to make a choice. So in some sense, I would say that in practice, if you're about to make an open application, I think you increase your chances by just sticking a pin in this college at random and applying to that college. Okay, officially, of course, it makes no difference. But I think it, in practice, it makes a very slight difference. 
Is Trinity in the city centre? <clears throat> the answer is yes, absolutely. However you define central college, Trinity is a central college. Um, there's a question, how much more difficult is it to get admitted if you're not from the UK? Well, <clears throat> I think the main problem is not the offer, it's probably the funding. So if you're from the UK, you can take a, get out a student loan. If you're from the overseas, it may be very hard to get a loan from your government. So you may need to rely on a bursary from a college and those are of course harder to get. But I think that's the main difficulty for overseas people is the money. Getting an offer is fine. That, that's done the same as for as UK applicants, you know, interviews followed by offer. But um, the financial side is, 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 is difficult. The, someone asks, what is the procedure for engineering with students from India? The answer is the same as for everyone else. You just apply through UCAS the normal way. There's, there's no positive or negative or, or different feature if you're applying from India. To what extent can you choose your accommodation in year one? Uh, Lizzie, do you know the answer to that? Um, so in year one, when you have an offer, you'll be asked um, basically what kind of room you want and how much you're willing to pay. Um, but the first year accommodation is primarily in two places. So you have the Wolfson Building and Angel Court. Wolfson Building has en suites, Angel Court tends not to. Um, but either way, you'll be living with lots of other first years and it's really easy to make friends. Um, but you will be able to um, like email someone in college if you have a specific requirement, like a dietary requirement or an accessibility need. Now, are we currently out of questions? There are none in the q and I don't think. Um, we had a question um, that's already been answered, but someone um, asked about staying at home versus staying in university accommodation. Um, and I think it, Cambridge differs to other um, universities in that it's very unusual to live out or to live in your own house or to commute to the university so pretty much every student unless there's like wildly extenuating circumstances has to live in college um, and you tend to not go out into like a house or find your own accommodation in second third year because the college provides it um, and that's actually quite nice a lot of people kind of resent not having that pretty student house experience where you're all eating pot noodles etc um, but it is really nice being able to like you, you live in college and it really becomes your home you know your friends are a two minute walk away the library's a two minute walk away you can go to hall with your friends every night if you want to um, so rather than being like oh why can't I live at home or oh, why can't I live in a house um, it's really nice it's like boarding school but you don't have any teachers or rules so but the kind of format of it is like a boarding school but it's it's very nice there's a question how important is it to have read subject specific material outside things set for a level <clears throat> the answer is that's a great thing to do so suppose you're doing chemistry a level doing some additional chemistry reading is, is a great thing to do because as i said earlier it increases your chemistry maturity your chemistry brain. So it'll help you think about your subject. So for any subject, any extra stuff you do beyond a level is fantastic. I don't mean go and read a university textbook, but read some material, watching an online lecture, getting a popular book, trying a, a you know, chemistry Olympiad questions. Those are all really great things to do. We don't, we don't even care which one of those you do. Anything you do, the more hours you spend on a subject, the better for you. And a lot of the successful applicants have spent many extra hours, but in all kinds of different ways, doing reading popular books, trying Olympiad things. But we need to go, we, we don't care. We, we, don't, we don't read your file and add points because you, you say you've done 18 hours of this or that, because we have no idea if it's true or not. Um, and also, we don't care. We care, can you do the sums? So you're not doing it. <clears throat> to gain points with us, you're doing it to become better at your subject. There's a similar question people often ask. They say, <clears throat> what do we think about an EPQ, an, an essay in your subject? In other words, we love it. Not because it looks good on your personal statement. We don't care. We're never going to say, oh, this person's got an EPQ, that's great. Or this person doesn't have an EPQ, slight mark against them. But the key thing is this, doing an EPQ means you'll spend, you'll spend many, many hours thinking about and writing about your subject. It's a great thing for you. So with, if you have a chance to do an extended essay, jump at it, absolutely. Not, again, not so you can put it on your personal statement, but because it makes you better at your subject. Ah, oh, a lovely question. 
what makes Trinity different compared to other colleges? So I think in science, it is particularly strong. There are huge numbers of fellows and a lot of your teaching will be in college all the way through your life. So you'll be often being taught by people who've taught you before. Because we're big enough, we have people in you know, all aspects of biology, physics, chemistry, and so on, which a smaller college doesn't have. So in terms of, perhaps in terms of getting to know your teachers, there's an advantage to being in, in, in Trinity. And we have so many more fellows than any other college, so that's quite a strong advantage. But apart from that, really, honestly, all colleges are nice. I, I wouldn't say, well, okay, I do feel Trinity is better than other colleges, but every college feels it's better than other colleges. So I think just basically, especially in science, uh, we have, a, we have a, a strong intake, and especially we have so many teachers that you will, you'll be taught in-house rather than being farmed out to different colleges' teachers in your second or third years. Lizzie, do you want to add to that in some way? Um, I think you've pretty much covered it. Um, also, Trinity has um, a huge amount of financial assistance available for home students, some for international students, but um, for home students especially. Um, so that's a nice thing to sort of like ease your mind whilst you're studying. Um, and also the pastoral um, support at Trinity is really great. Um, we have a mental health advisor, we have a college nurse. Um, there's so many systems in place to prevent you from, you know, having a big freak out and sort of getting a bit trapped in a Cambridge term. Um, there's loads of welfare initiatives as well from students as well to make sure that everyone's okay. And I think it's just like generally the community really looks out for each other, which is something that I think is quite special. There's a question, what situation the Trinity College gyms? The answer is yes, there's a gym. Yes, anyone can use it. And I think, you know, depending what the current COVID rules are, either you have to book in advance or you just turn up. But we have, a, we have a pretty good college gym. It's one of the biggest of the college. It's not the biggest. I think Churchill has the biggest gym of any college, but I think ours is, ours is one of the biggest. Um, there's a question, how does Trinity look out for students' mental well-being, and how do they make sure the culture is inclusive? That's a very good question. So <clears throat> what happens when you are I'll deal with the mental well-being first. So what happens when you're a student is this. I've talked about your supervisions. You do your course, you have your supervisors. So you have your supervisors. There's a second level. There's someone called your director of studies. They're in charge of your general academic progress. So you'll meet with them at least once a term. And they might say to you something like, which course do you plan to go to this term? Um, good idea, or perhaps that's too many, or what about that course? I'll give you advice on courses. They'll also select your supervisors. So for example, they will say something like, you know, I heard from your supervisor that you didn't work much last week. Are you okay? Is there a problem? And there's also a third level, there's your tutor. You have a tutor as well, not in your subject, who's there for what's called moral welfare. So, you know, if you're very short of money, you tell your tutor. They might not give you money, but they'll be sympathetic ear. If you have some personal issues, um, you would talk to your tutor. If you, if you felt something bad was happening to you, or you had some distractions, maybe you have a family member who's ill, something like that, you talk to your tutor. So in some sense, that's what makes Cambridge and Oxford different from other places in Britain. It's not just that the courses are harder and more interesting, which they are, or the students are better, which they are. It's the safety net levels. So in a typical other university in Britain, if you just decide to stop working, nobody will ever know until in June, you don't turn up for your exam. In Cambridge, if you miss a supervision, your supervisor will email you and say, hey, are you okay, what happened? If you don't reply to that, your director of studies will email you and say, what happened? I, you know, I hear you didn't reply to your, you didn't use a supervision, you didn't reply to your email from your supervisor, are you okay, are you ill, what's the problem? If you don't reply to that, someone will come and knock on your door and make sure you're okay and find out what's happening. So you can't just give up and hide. I mean, in some sense, it's a good job you can't, because if you dropped out for two weeks, let's say, because the pace of life is very fast here, it, it, it's very, very hard to catch up. Um, but there's this, there are all these levels of support. In terms of the culture being inclusive, um, I mean, a lot goes on at the beginning of the year in terms of making sure that everyone meets everyone. So you don't really get cliques forming at the beginning. Everyone knows everyone. There's one example, when people ask questions about, for example, private schools versus state schools. Um, most people, most students in, say, the first year, if you ask about their friends, it's not just they have a mix, 
but they wouldn't even know which their friends were at private school or state school. So it's really, it's completely homogenous. You don't get this group of people. You don't get, you know, you don't get people from that kind of school being a group or from that country being a group. Everything's really incred incredibly mixed. And again, I think as far as we know in Trinity, that happens at all colleges. There's a question, why do Trinity require um, the CSAT and our colleges don't? The answer for all such questions is that each college does their admissions process separately and they've thought through what they think is best to link in with what they teach and how they evaluate students. And it is just different. So for example, even in a given subject, say engineering, some colleges say you get one interview. Some say you have two interviews. Some give you a written test beforehand, some don't. It's just they're different ways of doing it. You might say it's charming and great. You might say it's incredibly annoying, but it's that's just, just the way it is. Um, someone asked, aren't EPQs difficult to, more difficult to complete for mathematical subjects because of equations and writing necessary? Well, no, I don't think so. I think people who do, people who are sciencey people normally like their science EPQ and couldn't imagine doing, a, doing a, an arts EPQ and, and vice versa. I think they're thinking what difficult to complete necessarily. <clears throat> um, there's a question, but if you're an Indian student, what exams do you need for, your, for admission? The answer is <clears throat> in your subject, after your interview, if they like you, they'll make you an offer based on the exams in your country. And the admissions office have a huge set of files for each country of their national exams, perhaps how they differ from state to state in your country and what the right offer is. So it'll be something appropriate to your country. Um, someone asks, if you've chosen not to do an EPQ because of other commitments of workload, is it held against your application? As I said, no, it's not held against your application. Yeah. It's perhaps a slight shame you're not doing it in terms of your knowledge of your subject, but we're not going to care. We're never going to give you a negative mark for not having done an EPQ. Okay. I think we're out of questions at the moment. Yeah, this is your... Your three minute warning. You have a question that you want answered. Say it now. Um, okay. So we're almost at the end. Oh, there's a question. What sort of scholarships are available? <clears throat> um, so there are scholarships which, which we have. Normally, once you get your offer, that's when you're told about the scholarships and so on. And they're normally awarded, they can be very large, they can cover your entire fees if you're from overseas, for example. And they're normally awarded roughly speaking in an academic way. So if you get a scholarship, then it'll be adjusted to your means. So if you're poor and can afford nothing, the scholarship will take you on everything, both your fees and your maintenance, meaning what you have to live on, your rent and food and so on. If you're quite well off, it might be a small amount. But the key thing is whether or not you get a scholarship to decide about academic grounds. You know, do we prefer the fifth best historian with the seventh best engineer. The tough questions for us, um, but once we've decided those things, then the, the financial amount will be, normally be adjusted to your own particular means. Can you attach extra source application like research paper? Yes, absolutely. It, 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 if UCAS allow it, then yes. And if not, then probably no. But people do often include, include extra things on their paper, on their paper, and that's fine for us. <clears throat> There's a question, how long after year 13 do you have to have your offer on average? So the way it normally works is, so you apply by about mid-October of your early in year 13. You get told about whether or not you're being interviewed in maybe November, second half of November. Your interview is prob probably mid-December, maybe a little bit earlier in December. And then because decisions have to be made and the pool has to run, there's quite a long wait before you hear your results. And every year it gets longer, I'm afraid. It's now something like about a four or five week wait. But you'll be told that very clearly. You know, on your interview day or around then, that the stuff you get from the college will include a statement, January the whatever is when you hear your results. But it is annoyingly so. We're really sorry. We know you'd like to know sooner. We're really sorry about that. But it is just a slow, it's slow because the pool has to happen as well. Question, is there a full, Scholarship for undergraduate students, yes, absolutely. As I mentioned, um, if, we, if you get one of our bursaries on academic reasons and you need a full scholarship, you'll get a full scholarship, absolutely. I think it's 12, so I think we may have to wrap up here.
Um, but I will pop in the chat um, Stacey's email. Stacey is our um, patient's um, coordinator. It was wonderful. Um, so if you have any more questions, um, please pop them to her. And you can also find this on our website as well. Um, and thank you, everyone. And thank you, especially to Imre, for answering all those questions like a trooper. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for asking your questions. Um, and I hope this was helpful. Um, I think the recording will be posted somewhere online um, if you want to look back at it. Um, but, yeah, thank you all for coming. And I hope this has maybe swayed you a bit towards Trinity. I'll, I'll never stop going for that hard sell. It's in my job description. Um, but, no, thank you all so much for coming and asking your questions. It's been lovely chatting with you all. Um, and everyone have a lovely day.